Okay, uh, this week I have the pleasure to introduce you, hopefully, hopefully not for the first time, to an artist I really admire. His name is Tony Gerber. He is, uh, he just makes wonderful music. It's, it's a very soulful kind of space, ambient music. Um, I just find it wonderful. And um, he is, uh, he's been doing this kind of stuff for a long time. And rather than kind of fill in all the blanks, I'll let him do it. So uh, with that, I say welcome to Tony Gerber. Hi, Tony. How are you? Hey, Darwin. I'm doing great. And thanks for asking me uh, asking me to do this. This is always it's kind of a fun thing. I, was, I, I don't think I'd mention this, but I grew up with a Darwin Gross. So it's funny because I kind of got it mixed up. I kind of got you mixed up for a little bit. Uh, I was thinking it was that person. but Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually in northern Indiana, but uh, the Gross family. Oh, that's crazy because, yeah. uh, I mean, the only other one that I knew of was uh, the head of the Akankar religion. They're like a soul travel joint. Huh? And the leader for a while was named Darwin Gross. And they even contacted me because at some point he had a vision about uh, Darwin, another person coming in and working with them. But then all of a sudden he kind of got caught with his fingers in the till or something, and he was out. And there went my chance for great religious <laughs> glory, right? <laughs> Sorry, I sidetracked us there. No, that's pretty interesting. I I I have to look this up because I've yeah. never heard of another one other than this one guy. So anyway, um, thanks a lot for being on the on the podcast. I am I personally am really excited about this because I've. I've long really enjoyed your music. For those listeners who aren't familiar with you, why don't you give us a kind of a quick overview and talk a little bit about what you're, the kind of stuff you're doing now? Okay, well, um, I mean, uh, you know, I'm in my I'm in my fifties, and I, uh, I mean, I started doing actually doing music in the late sixties, and got into electronic music very early at about ten years old, and. Uh, you know, played in the bands and did different things, and uh, but I was I was always interested in electronic music and and sounds. So, so I, you know, I've kind of created created my own niche of of uh, space music, uh, ambient mixing with some acoustic kind of electroacoustic ambient space. I guess it's hard. You know, the terms are terms are squirrely. I mean, yeah, they're pretty strangled. You're right. I mean, I you know I was influenced a lot by the kraut rock and uh, you know the early electronic stuff, even the academic stuff. So I'm kind of coming from that. So when when the new age terms and all that came around, of course you know that was a category, but that's not really where my inspirations lied. So, but anyway, I you know pretty early moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and I've actually been here about 35 years, and of course skirting around the outside of of uh, all of you know what people think of as Nashville, but actually, you know, there's every style of music here that you can imagine. So it's been a good place to to, to base myself out of, and I explore some. I, I explore a couple of other styles of music. Uh, I have a couple guitar albums out. Uh, I have a blues band called uh, Cotton Blossom Band. Uh, fairly recently, um, actually, my album last year, uh, Soul Shining, with that band was a top uh, ten album for Nashville and the surrounding state area from one of the publications here. So, you know, I've explored different stuff, but definitely my heart lies with space music and, you know, you would hear my stuff on Hearts of Space or Echoes. I mean, I've played up there for John DiLiberto and his living room concert. Right. You know, done the Gathering series a couple times. and uh, But uh, I really like to do this stuff live. So... That's that's part that's part of uh, you know part of my niche I guess is, is a lot of people don't do this kind of music live and then more recently like in the last ten years I've gotten into the virtual world which I'm sure we'll talk about and I have a whole persona in there and kind of a whole career virtually in there um, but uh, I you know I've done it I've been doing music since I was seven years old and it's and it's part of uh, it's just part of who I am, uh, part of my well-being, and uh, but then it's great that other people can get benefits from it as well. But I, I have kind of a holistic look at it, I guess. You know, I mean, it's uh, there's something very, uh, very relaxing about my music, even when, even when I'm trying to 
do something a little more edgy, it's still there's still some kind of liquid type of quality that's even on rock kind of stuff. Yeah, know? well, it's it's funny because it seems like um, some of the people that I've talked to about you speak of you in almost shamanistic terms, and it's funny that you brought up the new age thing because while um, while that relaxing quotient is there and while you use some of the instrumentation that's typical for new age stuff, I tend to think of your music as being more dark and maybe broody. And maybe it's just because that's, that helps you get it out of your system. I don't know. Well, I mean, I definitely do. I mean, there's definitely times that we start kind of pushing the envelope of some of the sonic sounds and, even in a live approach, or if you're feeding off of somebody else, depending on who that other person is, you know, we sure. could get into some fairly dark areas for sure. I mean, just, I mean, dark and just that it's edgy sounds and some discordant stuff and, right. you know, all that type of thing. But uh, when, it, when I, when I started using the Native American flute, which uh, I guess that might have been about 13 years ago, um, so it's actually fairly recent in my palette of instruments. Um, although I played woodwinds early in my early in my life, but uh, and I'm part Native American, so that also that also made the Native American flute a natural. But when I added that, that that added another quality that's that's actually not quite so dark. It might make something that's a little little darker in the padding lifted up a little bit, right. just in, in the in the fact that it's a flute. And it, it also made my music a lot more accessible uh, to people around the globe. And I kind of found that out because most of that time was spent in the virtual world uh, launching all that stuff, broadcasting all this music out as far as when I started adding the Native American flute. So I got, I've gotten a lot of feedback from different people around the world and um uh, you know, I mean, the flute. The flute is. There's just something special about the sound of a flute, and everybody's culture. It's such an old instrument. I mean, you know, we know of a 35,000 year old uh, griffin bone flute uh, that Neanderthal man used. So, I mean, it's you know, it's ingrained. Right. There's like a there's like a cellular resonance with that. It, uh, yeah, I really think there is. So, so that's that's attractive to people everywhere, and and when I travel around and play, you know, it's just uh, people really respond. They really respond to the flute, and they also respond to the iwi, which is an electronic wind instrument, and basically it's kind of like a, a synthesizer, saxophone, clarinet, flute type of a device. But again, it's a woodwind, and and you know, I mean, that's that's part that's part of it. The the intensity of uh, you know playing a woodwind instrument over electronics is that you get this very expressive, very from the heart. I mean, you're you know you're blowing your breath of life through this thing, and it lets you express. It's kind of like the lead singer of my you know of my music now. Right, it's, it's the flute or the ewe. I mean, you know, I'm 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 a melody guy. I like you know I melodies and that's lots of times you know that's my part drones and melodies with uh when i when i play with other people you know you were talking about just the the soul the soulfulness of it the the flute definitely is an extension of your breath and and very much like singing i guess if you know as far as a, a kind of a lead instrument right well it's it's interesting i <laughs> Um, for Father's Day, my family bought me a very nice uh, Native American flute, and I have been having a wonderful time with it, but I would say that the two people that have that I look to as inspiration on that are uh -huh. you you and Robert Rich. Now, Robert Rich uh -huh. plays uh, PVC transverse. pipes. <laughs> yeah, transverse flute. But. Right. Yeah. But, um, but uh one of the things that, that really excited me was uh, just before I got the flute, but I knew I was getting it, um, uh -huh. I got an opportunity to see you do a concert. Now, I want to talk more about your history with virtualized concerts because uh -huh. you were, you've been a very, very much a groundbreaker in that world. 
But I saw you do a concert uh, on a site called, I think, Concert Window. Is that correct? Yeah, Concert mm. Window. Yeah. And, and just real quick, what makes that so attractive is that you, there's, a, there's an app for uh, iPhone called Busk. And you can actually, just with one button, open up the app and push one button, and you can be broadcasting to your page. So it'd be concertwindow.com slash Tony Gerber. Right, Any, right. Anytime I open up that phone and broadcast, it's pushing to that page. So it, it's the quickest, easiest way to do a video broadcast stream for somebody that I've ever encountered. Now, the, the disadvantage is it's... I have to have my speakers on. I, I can't do it direct line in. I have to have my speakers on in my studio for the microphone to pick it up. Right. But that works okay, but it's just I don't I don't necessarily usually play that way in my studio. Sure. Usually under headphones. But I'm glad to know that you you saw that and that you know that it, it was turned out good because I've only done maybe four or five like that. Yeah. Well, it was really interesting. First of all, because um, I got to see some of the gear that you use. Uh, Someday you and I are going to have a long discussion about the sledge because yeah. that looks interesting to me, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's it's a Waldorf-based instrument. So if you're with Waldorf or Blofelds or any of that kind of stuff, uh, basically it's that type of an engine just with all the knobs more like a mini Moog to uh, control. Sure. Well, I like all the knobs. But, but the other thing is I got to see you play some of the woodwind-based stuff and – um, far more than when I, uh, far more than when I, uh, listen to your recorded work, seeing you perform, somehow seeing you play the melody uh -huh. kind of for me brought it forward. So when you talk about being a melody guy, um, I would, I would say when I, when I saw that performance, that really, that really struck me as you, you being out front. And again, this idea of the flute and the iwi being, um, being the lead singers, the oh. Rob, the Robert plants of your, uh, of your Led Zeppelin, <laughs> um, is, is, is very, was very, um, was very visceral in that, in that moment. So, um, in addition though, the, the performance thing, the virtual performance thing that, you are, I would dare say, famous for is the work that you've done in Second Life. Now, you are probably one of the first people I even heard of attempting this, but you built up, up a pretty significant following, and you you have been doing a long form, or a, you have been doing a, a, a performance practice there for a very long time, right? Since, yeah, 2006. Actually, February of 2000. February of 2006 is when I went in there. And then in May of 2006, I did my first uh, concert. Okay, so it's been like right on nine years already. Yeah. How many, how many performances have you done in that time? Uh, uh, right at about 1,600. <laughs> That's outrageous. So, um, but when you started it, had you heard of other people trying to do this at the time? Um, actually, no. I went in, I, I mean, what was interesting about the virtual world was I, I had just had a, my first and only child. I got married late in life and, um, you know, you kind of detach yourself a little bit from, well, not a little bit, I mean, I you know, I mean, I moved moved out of from in downtown of Nashville, you know, out in a suburb, and you know, got a house and and set my studio up, and and you know, just you're just not as a, uh, um, in the loop on stuff when you've got a family and starting a family. So anyway, as soon as a Ayla was born, I discovered the virtual world. I mean, like it was, it was maybe a couple months after she was born, and. I, I was big into three-dimensional uh, rendering, worked on a VAX 780 back in the mid-80s, and uh, doing an, even doing animation and stuff pretty early in, in everything. And so I imagined all kinds of 3D type of worlds, but then, then I was off into other stuff and kind of had forgotten about that. So when I actually went into Second Life for the first time, it just blew me away. I had no idea that that there was something that organized and that 
far advanced for, you know, and it really hasn't changed much since then, to be honest with you, uh -huh. you know, uh, but anyway, it's still, you know, it's still going, I st I'm still doing shows in there, but not near as much, but anyway, when I went in there, uh, you know, I realized that this would be a platform to do some live music, and one of the reasons is because I was, I'd gotten into internet broadcast pretty early here in Nashville, like in, in 1995, right at the beginning of the internet uh, kind of uh, thing, um, I set up uh, an internet radio station on Music Row, but it was, you know, it was so far ahead of anything, none of the labels were interested, no, I mean, I had people come and they didn't know, you know, they didn't know what to think, right. I was, I was broadcast, but I mean, it was more country related, but the technology and the concept was there early. And, and somebody came to me like 14 years after that and said, Music Row, the record labels are finally, you know, they're all excited about having their own internet radio station. <laughs> you know, and I mean, it was just, so anyway, I had an interest in the internet radio and realized that connection kind of with the virtual world, because that's basically what you're doing. You're doing a, a live radio broadcast and in the virtual world, the, the venues or the land that the people come to, uh, you plug the broadcast link into the land so their computer then picks up whatever I'm talking about or whatever I'm playing. Okay. So, so it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, another, uh, it's another place to have your broadcast. People can tune in and just listen to the audio or they can go into to the virtual world. And one of the things that I did early, very well, I mean, right at the beginning, was I associated myself with a group, a large group that was already established in Second Life. And when I was younger, I mean, I was into reading, uh, reading high fantasy and science fiction and, you know, dragons and, and Hobbit and all that kind of stuff. So I... I I, re I, I discovered that there was a lot of elves and fairies and dragons and, and gnomes and all the, you know, the high fantasy group. And I went in there and it was actually the largest, most organized group in there. So I, I basically went in as an elf then. And I started hanging out with that community, okay. which a lot, of, a lot of them were my age and actually older, even 10 and 15 years older, you know, older hippies and just... I mean, it was just a group of people that were really into live music and they were just good people. So anyway... Uh, I got real involved there, but what it what it meant was the first time I decided to do a concert, I pretty much you know filled up the thing because right. you had all, a built-in audience, right? My people there came, you know. So, so anyway, I started out that way, and and uh, I think there was less than ten of us when we you know when I started performing because I mean I wasn't the first, but I discovered the other guys that had come in, and uh, well, and not I mean there was a couple women too, so. But I was, you know, in the first ten to to perform in Second Life, wow. and I went in really in a professional way. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I went in with all seriousness, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, and created posters for every show, and you know, I set up stores all over the virtual world in different places. I sold my, uh, and still do. I mean, there's vending machines that have my flutes that I modeled in 3D, and then they have my sample loops of my flute playing. So people that don't play music, they can buy one of my flutes and they can pull it out and, you know, it plays the sample and everybody else in the room can hear it in the virtual world. And, you know, I sell those for 1,500 Lindens, which is like $6 in U.S. dollars. Right. Whenever, when they buy that, it goes into my PayPal account. So, you know, I kind of discovered a, a different way of making some money since really in 2006, the CD sales pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much when it died. Right. Yeah, so uh, you know, this was a this was a, a different way of of making some making some money. I mean, to basically pay for my time and my effort into it because you know having a family and trying to do all that. I mean, it wasn't like I could just be in there and you know just tooling around and spending it. Because early on, I spent a lot of time to set up basically the kind of music empire that I set up in there. And started collaborating with other artists and doing some, you know, really, there's a, there's some YouTube stuff up there. Like if Cypress Rosewood is what my name is, and they're like the two trees, C-Y-P-R-E-S-S, -S, Rosewood. And if you type that in YouTube, it'll bring up a bunch of different stuff. But, uh, 
there's there's some of the things that we did. It's it's kind of like a type of performance art that really could not take place any other place, and um, it was very very exciting. And working with programmers and artists and uh, you know uh, animators and uh, so it was really you know I had a really really great time with all that and uh, and it kind of changed for me in 2010 because we had a major flood here and right. we had about five foot of water in our house so that kind of der that derailed the because I was at a fervor right before that of doing stuff in there and and. Uh, you know, it kind of it changed a little bit, and I actually started doing a lot more real life concerts again. So, um, so it, it, it started edging off. But I mean, I still do you know one or two concerts a week, um, and have kept up one Sunday night show since two thousand eight. So for seven years, I've been doing every Sunday night, unless I'm out of town or doing another live show. Uh, yeah, actually, the the one time that I that I saw one, of you, I I was never a Second Life person, but uh -huh. at one point I was uh, visiting my friend Mike Metley, and he was like, he was like, oh, Tony's doing a show. Have you ever seen one of these? I'm like, no, and so he tuned in and kind of like stood in the background and watched it, and it was it was wild, but it was also, you know, if if you're not into it, it's it's almost a little disturbing because. You see these things, and and they look like iconography of different types. And some people put an amazing amount of effort into it. Right. But uh, when, but all of a sudden, you realize these are each one of those things represents an actual person. It's right. really pretty amazing. Well, it is, and and I just remember how I was for the first two or three months in there, and I mean, it blew my mind. I mean, it still kind of blows my mind some, but I mean, it, boy, for the first few months. You know, it was it was very intense, and uh, you had to act. You kind of had to acclimate to it. Well, sure, and especially I think um, you talked about sort of like taking on the persona of an elf. I mean, there's a lot of us that grew up in sort of the science fi science fiction fantasy world, right? Right. Um, but the only the only opportunity to really sort of like live that life was. Uh, you know, occasionally when, you know, some hotel would get taken over by, uh, you know, by a group or something for a weekend. But it was never, this This was the first time you could actually sort of like live an entire life and not ever have to break out of character within yeah. that world. And, and it's kind of like a book. I, I've equated it to people like when you read a really good book, the place that your mind goes um I mean, it's not exactly the same, but there's a similarity oh, there. Oh, sure. Right. Um, but, but the thing about the virtual world that's really interesting is it forces you to be in the moment. And <clears throat> you can't really, I mean, it really does force you to be in the moment. And, and it tears down any stereotypes of anything because you don't really know, you know, you don't know that the person you're talking to might be in a wheelchair. You know, you don't know what their skin color is, what their religion is. And it, and it doesn't really matter, right? You know, and and it's and that's kind of enlightening in some ways. You know, I don't. It's, it's that that's really interesting. But being doing these shows in Second Life, kind of especially the Sunday night show. One thing it's kind of worked into is I know you're wanting to talk about the live aspect, and because that is what I really thrive on is playing this stuff live, and uh, the Sunday night show. I've started doing. Well, I mean, I started doing it years ago, but these duo concerts. And so I invite friends of mine to come over to my studio to do the Sunday Night Show live. Mm -hmm. Lot, Lots of times, in fact, the one this past Sunday, two nights ago, was uh, Stephen Seifert, and he's a dulcimer player. He's a mountain dulcimer player. And, um, I mean, he also dabbles in some other stuff now. He's got a keyboard and some other stuff. But he's very well known as a, as a mountain dulcimer player. Okay. Uh, so, and we've done some stuff before. We actually did a three-way triple uh, trio daisy chain type of concert uh, very early on, like eight years ago, probably in 2007, uh, with uh, my friend Jan Pulsford, who was with uh, Cindy Lauper and uh, uh, for a few years co-produced and wrote a bunch of stuff with her, and she was with... A, uh, uh, the Thompson twins back in the eighties. Oh, yeah, right. She's from England, so 
anyway, I dragged her into the virtual world, and we ended up doing a, a triple thing, uh, which was really interesting. But my whole point was, I'm bringing people that I, you know, that that don't necessarily play this kind of music, and because it's because most of it's in the moment, you know, it, it's uh, I we we don't discuss a whole lot of stuff before the shows. I mean, we might, you know, we might trade a couple sounds and. You know, I've got some favorite keys I like to play in, and, and my favorite flutes are in, and I'll right. throw those ideas out. But generally, you know, it's this kind of a blend where the the visiting artist is, you know, I'm drag, I'm pulling them over to the space side, you know, and, and trying to trying to have them slow down, you know, listen twice, play once, kind <laughs> of, you know, just. Uh, it it's a different experience for them so they always leave here you know and, and you know they're like man you really took me on a, an adventure you know a musical adventure so i love it because if you know whenever i play with somebody else it, it just makes you know you've got a formula there you got an a plus a b and it's going to equal something else than right. just yourself or you know if the b is a different you know different person uh, every different person mixes to have a different uh, uh, formula or you know a different outcome, and uh, I really really enjoy that a lot. So there's been all kinds of different people. I mean, uh, you know, people here in Nashville, people that are into doing the space music, or people that are not. You know, right. well, it's funny because uh, it seems like Nashville is the perfect spot for it. Because you do have, and, and I've heard this before from other people, that Nashville, people think of it as solely a country mecca, but that actually it is sort of for the center part of the I mean, U.S. It's, it's like the center of all kinds of music. Yeah, it's music city. Right. It's not, it's not country music city, it's music city. And and I mean, you there are the, I mean, I've heard the best people from India, Africa, South America, I mean, you know, jazz. I mean, we got craft work coming in mm -hmm. September to the Ryman Auditorium. <laughs> now, I, I would have never, ever, would have ever thought years. That those two things ever would go together. <laughs> but, you know, it's a lot more, I think people realize a lot more that it's all styles of music. And, uh, and I'm actually working on a, a, like a TV show. It'll be like a YouTube show or, or, you know, that'll be the delivery system through the internet, but it'll be a regular, uh, you know, kind of uh, in a venue production. But uh, its main purpose is to show all different styles. So one, one week we might have bluegrass, one week we might have electronic, one week we might have, you know, uh, Tuvan throat singers, and next week it might be some drummers from Burundi. I mean, you know, I just, I want to have something coming out of Nashville that the world can tune into and they can see all this amazing music from around the world of all the people that come to Nashville and play. Cause it seems like everybody ends up through here at one time or another. So right. if I'm able to tap into some of that and get, get some of them to play live and, and you know, so that's, that's one thing I'm working on. I'm I thought it was going to get launched earlier than it is, but, but we're still moving forward on it, but okay. it's actually called the music tellers. So, I'll be able to check that out. So one question I have, and it went, this this is kind of particular to when you're in a music center. So I, I do a bunch of work out of L.A., but Nashville and New York and sometimes Chicago will all have this same kind of thing. Sometimes when you're in a place with the best possible musicians, what you get is a very, very high level of musicianship but it's it's almost too showy. Now you talk about when you do these duets that you kind of are trying to drag people, maybe kicking and screaming, uh, into a more slowed down mode. Right. Um, how how difficult do you find that? And, and are there kind of things that you do in your playing that kind of draws them in that direction? Because you talk about not really talking over a lot of stuff. So how right. is it that you draw people into slowing down and be more contemplative? Well, I would like, I, I mean, my perception when you say, uh, or showiness or, 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 you know, my perception on that is that generally the musicians in Nashville, they are some of the best in the world for sure. And, but the showy part 
is not so much there in the musicians that are here. Lots of times because they're more studio musicians or more behind the scenes. Um, in L.A. and New York, I mean, I can see how some of the, uh, there's a lot more flash and a lot more stuff that might go with it. The flash here is just purely in the raw talent of the playing, usually. You know, it's like they don't have to try to be flashy. Right. <laughs> what they're playing is, you know. So, you know, that's been a real, definitely a real pleasure to be able to be around that stuff because it uplifts, you know, your own stuff. Sure. I, mean, I mean, it uplifts it by them playing with it, but it also uplifts you to play better than you might before when you're in the context of some of these, you know, different, different people. So I think the tones of sounds that I have and, and the drones a lot, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't take but a 60 seconds probably to put a calm on this situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't lay, know. Lay a nice drone blanket down, and everyone understands it, huh? Right, and I'm usually start. I'm usually, you know, I'm usually starting out. Right. You know, so they're kind of, you know, kind of do like I do sometimes when I go play with somebody else. I'm kind of like playing off of what they're. They're they're kind of leading the way, and I'm, you know, doing my melodies and stuff to weave in and out. But they're kind of the timeline. Right. So that's kind of the way it is when I come over here. I'm kind of the timeline, and they're, you know. Uh, adding embellishments and weaving in and out with, with their their deal. So. Sure, got it. There's two things about these live performances that I really want to dive into. One of them we started talking about, so I'll kind of continue in that vein. Sure. If you've done six, 1,600 performances, where do you get the motivation for the next one? Now, I can see where the, doing the duets is going to open a door to something new and you know exciting. But you still do a lot of this stuff solo, right? Yeah, but you know, don't forget it's it's of the moment music. So so the reason the reason that I can keep doing it is because it's not the ever the same. I mean, I you know I have my stylistic things and little motifs here and there and certain sounds and you know, but it but it morphs. Like if I if I go back and listen to, to my the music that I was doing nine years ago, right. Um, if if I would follow through, and I really haven't even done this. I mean, I have a little bit, but not not like purposely gone and done it. But if I would take some samplings from each year, and and there would be a definite definite morphing of where the music's went. Sure. And it and it's not me sitting and writing specific songs and then playing them. You know, it's it's me in the moment creating whatever mood I'm in, context. You know, whatever. I mean, it's just. So it, it's it's always different. I mean, there are similarities. I mean, there's gonna be similarities doing that, you know, that much stuff. But I'm trying to think of what it's more like. It's more. It's it's almost like for me. It's almost like a meditation for an hour. Right. Um, I'm almost tunnel vision, or really almost unaware of my surroundings. I'm so hyper focused into to what I'm playing, and. Um, it's it's like I said. It's not there. There'll be some similarities, but I don't get tired of it because it's not the same thing. Right. If I, if I was doing a rock, you know, rock or folk or something like that, where I was singing the same songs over and over, you know, that that would get pretty laborious to me. And that's why I'm really into in the moment music and doing it live that way. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I mean, I have actually for my playing, I have a problem because I have real issues with memorization. Well, I, yeah, in, too in, anymore. So this solves that. Yeah, it sure, sure does. Even make it an issue. And I mean, and all that is, all that is part of it. You know, it's like I don't have time to rehearse lots of times with different, even my band Spacecraft, which, you know, that uh, probably that's probably the most well known project I've done. You know, we could we could never rehearse. Half the band was in Lexington, and half the band was in Nashville. Right. And basically, the longer we were apart, when we would come together and do a show, the more interesting it would be. Sure. Well, and it's something because you talk about your solo things being kind of a meditation, but working with a band can be kind of a meditation too. But one of the things taking that approach is going to do is it's going to mean not only is it of the moment in terms of what notes you're playing and instrumentation you're using, but it's also going to be in the moment in terms of where you are currently emotionally, physically, 
you know, psychically, all that stuff is going to have its impact. So when you talk about kind of like following the train of time, you would pro- what you would probably be seeing is actually the change in your sort of like emotional stability, the change physically as you as you age or whatever. All these yeah, all things, things are going to be heard in the music. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, and, and the thing is, you know, I've recorded the first couple years of plan. I didn't record much. Um but I recorded some, but ever since then, you know, I've recorded almost every show. I mean, I've got hundreds of hours of recordings of all this stuff. And the last two years, it's all multi-track. So I've got all these hours and hours of concerts that are all multi-track. So, and I've never even went, you know, I (laughs) think I've released maybe, well, I've released, I mean, since I started doing the second life thing, I've probably released maybe five albums. Um, uh, four or five albums that stem from that music, right. you know, that was created in there. But I've got, so that's part of what I'm trying to do is figure out, you know, how can I, uh, you know, how can I use all this stuff working? And, and uh, I do have a, a, a Sony PlayStation 4 game with some guys in Europe and Tokyo that I'm working on that uh, were, were very big fans of my music. And they used my music as they did programming and as they did graphic arts for this game. Okay. And then they couldn't think of anything else but my music for the game. Of course. So they, so they contacted me, and under that premise, and that was really, I loved the way that happened. Sure. So, I, I mean, I was able to just send them maybe, you know, 10, 12 hours worth of music. Um, and, and they were able to find stuff that, that worked. So, you know, that's, you know, that's what I would like to find more stuff like that, obviously, because the sure. stuff's already been done. Right. And uh, even even the uh, even the soundtrack that I did at uh, for uh, Vanilla Sky, the Tom Cruise movie, the Paramount Pictures, that was that was also, you know, from an album that we had already recorded. Right. So, you know, I I am really, really into recording that moment of creation. So that's why, you know, like I, I look at music, the art of music and the craft of music. And the art of music is more what I do. The craft of music is more when you, you know, you, you practice the songs over and over and over again. And basically you're crafting a song. Right. What I'm doing is I'm creating in the moment. So that's more like, you know, when you're doing a painting or, right. you know, or something like that. Yeah, that's... That's the interesting view of it because, right? It seems it seems like songwriting is like being a sculptor, but yeah. but what you're doing is more like being a graffiti artist. <laughs> yeah, po- yeah, possibly for sure. There is the sculptor kind of thing with the layering of the sounds, right? And, and you know, some of the sonic kind of. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, we're doing stuff with surround sound and seven one, and there's definitely a lot more. It, Sculpture is a really good uh, analogy for that, but what you just said, for what I would have described in the in the moment, is a lot like uh, <laughs> graffiti, like speed painting of some sort. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about, and, and you you've opened the door a little bit just in these last statements. Um, a second life used to be on everyone's mind. Now it's not so much. I mean, there are still active communities there, but oh, yeah. things have things. You know, the in terms of being like the center of people's vision of the internet, it's it's well, here's, you know, here's, things. yeah. Here's what's kind of happened there. I mean, there's still like when I go and log in, there's usually uh, there's almost always over fifty thousand people that are logged in. Okay, so I mean, you know, that's a that's a that's a pretty good. You know, that's a pretty good chunk. I mean, it's not like Facebook or something like that. Right. But <clears throat> if Facebook or something like that does bring this platform and this concept in with the goggles and stuff, you know, I'm just wait. I'm waiting for that next level of this to happen because, you know, the the track record that I have, I mean, I should be able to go in and go gangbusters on whatever the next thing is. You know, sure. basically building on kind of what I've already done i mean i'd probably be starting from scratch again but uh, the the experience and the concept of everything's there so but but what's happened is it's the the media's quit talking about it and there's some things that changed but the people that are in there are spending longer time in there uh-huh. so 
it's it's kind of sh it's kind of shifted because there's you know the plot it's it's really a plot it's it's not a game it's a platform so you got people in there doing education you got people in there doing you know all all kinds of stuff that are that's not like World of Warcraft type right. type of stuff. Right. A lot of that stuff's still going on. Now, some of the businesses pulled out. You know, there were some businesses, and they just couldn't they couldn't make it work, or they weren't willing. What happened is is the 2008 crash. Um, a lot of the corporations pulled out and saw it as an extra expense instead of hanging in there and and riding with it. Because I actually put Gibson guitar in there back in 2008, uh, before you know, like a year before the 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 economy tanked. We built this incredible island for Gibson. It was a one-year project, and I was in the virtual world every day, doing that, and had a blast. And we had all we had celebrities coming in, and all kinds of stuff lined up. And then the economy tanked, and Henry, the guy, the president, and CEO of uh, of Gibson, just you know freaked out and pulled the plug. Right. That was after he sunk a lot of money and a lot of time. You know, I mean, we had got a lot of stuff going, so that was really. For like two hundred ninety-five dollars a month, or whatever his net was to keep the thing going, I thought that was pretty short-sighted because he right. put he put a lot of money into it. But um, you know, it some of that stuff changed the media when the big business you know didn't have as much involved in some of the stuff. It it, it changed the attention some, but Got it. uh, but it's still you know it's 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 still pretty cool. And and there's also Open Sim and some others. You know, open architecture kind of stuff that a lot of people are are migrating to, and so. But the next big thing, it really hasn't changed much though in nine years. So the next level of something is going to have to probably be the goggles and you know uh, a, a different a different platform, but but similar. Yeah. So how do you imagine swiveling to something like that? Because you know, you admitted that when you got started in Second Life, you put a lot of effort into building the persona and the environment and sort of your your place in that space right how do you when you put that much effort into a platform how harsh is it to think about the next platform i mean is it something you don't want to think about until it's obvious or is it something that you're kind of actively looking forward to and I'm, looking for I'm, I'm act, yeah i'm actively looking i mean you know because i'm usually have been kind of on the front edge of the wave type of stuff right my whole career so you know i'm i'm when, when i when i came across second life my skin was buzzing I mean, that's, <laughs> how, that's how excited i was and i've had other things in my life that i that i followed have that same response so when that happens to me, I know that I'm definitely doing the right thing. Right. right. So, <clears throat> you know, because I'm an intuition kind of person. It's just, you know, I mean, the music's intuitive, and I just try to, I try to, as best as I can, stay in the moment and enjoy each day and follow my intuition. Sure. Um, so the music's a lot that way, and hopefully something will present itself you know, the next level. And no, I mean, I'm not like, <clears throat> I can totally imagine retooling up and doing whatever the next level thing is because, I mean, you know, I, I got a lot out of Second Life. I don't go in there at all anymore. I just bop in to do my show and I'm out. I don't right. spend any time in there at all anymore. But I mean, I'm not making near as much money either. Right. You know, I mean, there was a time when, you know, it was a pretty good amount of, I mean, it was, you know, a sizable amount of money when I was doing the shows. Uh, you know, is you know sometimes two, three shows a day. Yeah, I mean, you know that's that's a lot of work, and and people appreciate it. And, oh sure. It, but you know, because radio is different. People don't tip with radio. You can do a radio show on a major network, you know, and and mention you got a website there with a tip jar and whatever, and and nobody comes over. You might get one or two people, you know. Right. But in Second Life, it was set up as a precedent to tip the live music. And that was just from the very beginning. That was part of it. And people, you know, people just they appreciate live music. I mean, they're hungry for live music. So, and my style of music is different than you know. If you have a rock band or something, you try to go into Second Life. You know, it's just not. I mean, you hear one, and that's about it. Yeah. But because mine's different every time, and because it's 
it's more contemplative and it's good music while you're working on the computer. It helps right. you focus. There's lots of things about the style of music that was perfect for the virtual world. So the model and the type of thing that I had just wouldn't fit everybody's music because it had a lot to do with what the music is and the, the style for that, for that type of environment. So, Do you think that, that, that there's any opportunity for music the way that you do it in the current kind of streaming world? Because right now it strikes me that a lot of what's being done in streaming is sort of the antithesis of what was happening with Second Life. It's sort of like, it's sort of like trying to emulate either the radio model or the endless record collection model. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of opportunity for live playing unless I've kind of missed something. And if I had, I'd love to know. Well, I can <laughs> say on the live thing, living in, living in Nashville, you know, this this is not a very good this is not a very good town to do live music. I'm not not saying that there's I mean live music is going on all the time in this town, but that's part of the problem. You know, the town's pretty jaded. Right. I don't even do all that. I mean, I do stuff here. But, you know, it's just, you never really make any money here. Nobody ever gets paid here. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard to believe. I mean, you can go 30 minutes away from Nashville and, and get paid at a venue, you know, and that's a lot more similar in the rest part of the country. Mm -hmm. But what I've started doing recently, like last year, is I'm starting to go to the places in the world that I sold the most music and the people that I know are really into this kind of music. And that and that tends to be the north, the far north, like Quebec and Iceland and Finland and right. you know, Russia and uh, Malaysia actually and I mean there's all these places that I know, I have fans, I've talked to them, I know from the numbers when I was selling CDs with distributors that they you know, they bought stuff over there and right. like in Russia they bootleg all my stuff, you know, and I, <laughs> I get all kinds of stuff and the, you know there was no way for me to meet the economy, you know, there's no way for me to have anything to sell to them. You know, if you're only making 20 bucks a month, you know, how are you going to play $10 for a CD or $15? You know, it was ridiculous to try to figure out how to even do it. So, I, you know, I had some people ask me if they minded if they duplicated my music and sold it on the streets, bootleg. And I said, I don't care if, the, you know, if, if, if there's people that really want to hear it that bad, I just look at it as PR and I don't right. worry about the money aspect. Just make sure your name's on it, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, some people get bent out of shape. And I, I mean, if you know, there's blatant stuff that I would probably get bent out of shape over. But I, you know, that I just, you know, I don't see how you can. It'd be hard to work within their economy to right. figure out how to even get the music delivered to them. Sure. So, and I know it helps people. I get emails sometimes from people that they tell me how they use the music, and you know, those are the really. I mean, that's some of the best stuff. You know, when when somebody when it touches somebody's life in a positive way, and they have some story about you know, how the music works for them because right. it's different for everybody. That's, that's a pretty amazing thing. I, and I think the opportunity to kind of travel based off of the people that you've met and the people that you've touched is pretty, is pretty amazing. Now, given your history um, in sort of developing your own performance practice and one that, you know, it's kind of peculiar, but kind but pretty interesting and amazing. What advice would you give to somebody who right now might be in their bedroom playing with their pile of gear to basically take the next step and to be a little more in the moment and be a little bit more present for the outside world? How, how do you get people, how can you, how do you think you could help people get out of the bedroom? I mean, uh, you know, the internet broadcast is definitely, I mean, I, you know, that's, that would be the best way I could, that I could say. I mean, uh, one one of my friends who lives in Denmark, I met in Second Life, and uh, his name's Torben Asp, and he was a bedroom artist for years. He never ever played a live concert out of the bedroom. Well, then he, uh, but but he was broadcasting. You know, that was that was his first blast out onto the global global stage was. Uh, broadcasting through Second Life, but you know it doesn't have to be Second Life. It can be all kinds of stuff. There's different radio stations that pick up live broadcasts. So 
you know, you can you can pick up a, a little mini Mac for a hundred dollars, an old one, because it doesn't have to be anything fancy to broadcast. Like I've I've got one, and it sits there twenty four seven broadcasting my playlist and my music and stuff that was on my label I had a few years ago. And then when I play live, I just switch it over into live mode and broadcast. I mean, that is definitely the best way to get outside of the bedroom. And and Torben, he he met somebody in Second Life in Ohio and became kind of romantically involved or whatever. And he ended up coming over to the United States and came to Ohio. And I talked to him into driving down to Nashville, which it's probably, you know, six hours drive or something. And he played his first live concert with me in real life here in Nashville. <laughs> That's an amazing story. Yeah. And, and it was, you know, cause I, I mean, I just kept telling him his music was so awesome. And I was like, man, you just have to do this live. You just have to do this live. And after, you know, a few years, he finally did, and it was with me over oh, here. That's amazing. That's great. But yeah, I would definitely, you know, the internet is is definitely the way to, you know, to where you can stay in your bedroom and you can still have an audience that's out there, and you can feel the live energy. You know, I mean, as an artist, you can feel the live people out there on the stream listening, and if you're listening, you can tell that it's live. You know, there's some kind of energy. That's that's there, just like a real concert. Yeah, it's being it's trans- transmitted yeah, somehow. But it is transmitted somehow because you can tell if somebody's spinning, right? You know, and not playing. Right. And I don't know how. I don't, you know, but you can most of the time. <laughs> well, Tony, I want to thank you for the fabulous and wide-ranging discussion. It was great to hear uh, both about your background, but really about kind of your vision for your future as well. It's really exciting. Um, yeah, thanks for asking, for sure. Yeah, and uh, where is it that uh, people should go to most easily hear some of your some of your work? Because I well, want to make sure that I love it. I want to make sure that I introduce other people to it. Yeah, probably the best portal is TonyGerber.com. And that's the easiest one to remember. But if you just tack my name on the end of a lot of the sites, you'll find stuff too, like sure. ReverbNation.com slash Tony Gerber, YouTube.com slash Tony Gerber, SoundCloud.com slash Tony Gerber, BandCamp.TonyGerber.com. Right. Between all of that, there's a ton of music out there. All right, fantastic. Well, Tony, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. All right, Darwin. Thank have, you. Have a great one. Bye. Too, buddy. Many thanks to Tony Gerber for taking the time to talk with me for the podcast. It was really interesting to hear his perspectives, particularly on the different varieties of playing live. It's uh, He's an incredible performer. If you have a chance to check out any of his online performances, you deserve to uh, give that as a gift to yourself. Um, I want to thank everybody again for listening. It's always great to have the fantastic numbers I've been having for the podcast especially during the doldrums of summer. So I appreciate you continuing to listen. Um, Those of you who live in the Midwest, uh, just a quick note. It looks like I I don't have a particular place yet to announce for Lincoln, but it looks like Lincoln's coming together. Des Moines is for sure coming together. We're trying to get something to happen at Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, Drop me a line, ddg at cycling74.com. If you want to keep in touch on whenever we're going to perform, wherever it's going to be. And also, if you just have any questions, comments, ideas for people in podcast, whatever, uh, I always love hearing from you. So thanks a lot for listening, and I will catch you next time around. Bye.